because several people have said to me this morning um, that because of what he did, because of Wayne Cousins' actions and the way that he used his position to arrest this young woman um, and get her into a car in the first place, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, what do we do now if we're approached by a police officer? Well, I think one should keep a sense of proportion. As I say, there are bad apples in every barrel. Uh, you know, you have teachers who abuse children. You have uh, renegade priests. You, you have bad apples everywhere and in families, too, of course. Uh, so I think one should keep a sense of proportion. Um, this was a particularly cynical and premeditated uh, crime uh, in which he did indeed use his position as a police officer. But how many other such instances can you name? And the answer is, this was rare. We all pray it was a one-off, but it mm. was certainly rare. Yeah. If you're approached by a police officer, my advice to the public would be, as long as it is a police officer, trust him. Yes. I mean, I think many people have also pointed out that, generally speaking, police officers go around in twos, and there's a reason for that. It's so that you can know that they are genuinely police officers and also the fact that they can uh, also have two people who can uh, explain what may or may not have then happened. Yes, and it's easy to say in retrospect, you know, that perhaps uh, Sarah should have been a, a bit more alert. But what was she to do? She was confronted with a policeman with a warrant card. Yes. Uh, there were COVID laws, which she was allegedly breaking. What was she supposed to think or right. do? No, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, I don't I don't think you can in any way suggest that she should have done something else because it was his um, absolutely horrific kind of deception that caused her to get into the car. And as you I say... What I was trying to say was, you know, the fact that he was on his own um would not necessarily uh, have alerted people but no. in general you can expect what you say is right in general you can expect police officers to be in two yes i think so let's talk a bit about this idea from dominic Raab because you've worked in the justice system uh, yourself and he thinks it's a good idea that because we're so short of workers which is perhaps another story we should discuss yeah. uh, that yeah. we should hire prisoners uh, to go on sort of day release and and go and go to work for the day what do you think of that well, as I read, what he's saying is um, the prisoners we should be using are those who've just been released and will probably be finding it difficult to get work because they have a criminal record. Um, and those who are already on day release, well, yes. let's, let's employ them gainfully. Mm. Um, and yes, uh, I'm all in favour of that. But I ask a bigger question, Mike, which is this. If we've got such a huge shortage of workers in this country, and it appears we have, why on earth? Is anybody on the dole? Well, <laughs> I mean, letting aside physical limitations, why is anybody on the dole? Well, this is a question I put to uh, to my audience a little bit earlier, Anne, because I'm also similarly puzzled. If we've got 1.3 million people supposedly unemployed, yeah. and there are vacancies for things I'm like HGV drivers, uh, jobs which are being offered at around £50,000 a year, why wouldn't you want to do that? Well, I think as far as the HGV drivers go, that's a question of qualification. But you don't need a qualification to pick fruit. Yeah. You know, you don't need a, a qualification to pack stuff. You don't need qualifications for an awful lot of the jobs which are now vacant. Even in the hospitality trade, a very quick, swift training uh, uh, will help to get you started. So I really don't see uh, why we have so many people on the dole. Yeah. And at the same time, so many um, vacancies without requiring particular qualifications. The truck driver shortage is a bit different. Yeah. Well, we hear all the time, though, don't we, that the benefits system has become very complicated. An awful lot of people who are on benefits are actually working as well. So they're not making enough money. And we have this bizarre system where we top up their wages with taxpayer funded benefits, which I think is a mistake anyway. Um, but there clearly are people unemployed who don't have work to do. Um, who surely, as you say, should do it. Because I remember a couple of weeks ago, there was a couple of pig farmers up north who were saying they were going to have to slaughter a load of pigs because the previous workers that they had were from the European Union and they couldn't find anybody in Britain to do the job um, of butchering the pigs. I found that extraordinary. Well, I don't think I'd very much like to butcher pigs. I, 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 well, luckily <laughs> you have other talents, Anne. You know, there's no need for you to do that. Um, but, I, but I think in general... Um, where somebody is able to do a job and is physically competent to do the job, uh, then I think that um, the state shouldn't take no for an answer. And the problem is that people can still say no. Yes. But, I mean, on a broader question, why do you think there is this sort of shortage? Because we're told it's not just in Britain, that it's all over the world, that we have a sort of shortage of, of manpower, stroke woman power. Uh, we have a shortage of uh, people moving things around. We're told that there could be a problem at Christmas. You know, I know that we get told that every year and it doesn't always come true. But there does seem to be a general kind of, and I think it's COVID-inspired 
uh, nonsense going on where people are not operating as they normally should be operating? I think a lot of things uh, have come together. Uh, with the truck drivers, it's, you know, 47,000 delayed tests um, has really exacerbated the problem hugely. And you do have to ask uh, what the Ministry of Transport was thinking of uh, in just allowing that to uh, to pile up, COVID or no COVID. Mm. Um, but then something else is happening. Um, as a result of furlough, people reassess what they were doing. And I know people, and, and, and so it's a microcosm of what's going on in general. And I think it's happening everywhere, in Europe and everywhere. Yeah. Uh, people who didn't want to be at home saw, for example, that construction was still working. So they said, fine, right, well, we go off and work in construction. Mm. I know a chef who did just that. He's not going back to chefing. Right. So there's a gap there in the hospitality trade where he was. Um, but in normal circumstances, he would never have dreamt of doing that. And I think COVID will have caused a lot of people to make decisions about where they live, um, whether they want to work from home, whether they want to do the job they were already doing or switch to another. Mm. And, and there is all this going on in the economy and it's going to take a while to settle. Yes, because today, for example, it's the final day of furlough, supposedly. So it could be yes. that potentially tomorrow there'll be a few hundred thousand people unemployed. Because I was saying to somebody earlier, if you're in the travel business and you're, or you're running an airline and you've been furloughing people, you're still not really up to full capacity. You might not have a job for that person. No, I think that probably will happen in a number of cases. But in general, people have had a long time to plan for this moment, both employers uh, and employed. Uh, and uh, it shouldn't come as a nasty shock. We've known for a very long time now that furlough was due to end, mm. uh, uh, as it must. It, it's a temporary measure, as should the £20 uplift um, in, in uh, universal credit. Uh, you've got to, to say that when something is temporary and has been uh, subsidised, a huge cost by the taxpayer when it comes to an end it is at an end and we've all known it was coming and people should have prepared for this moment i think so uh, and finally keir starmer um perhaps one of the most boring <laughs> conference speeches i think i've ever seen um apparently he's now come out and said he thinks the next james bond should be female well the man's a complete idiot look <laughs> james bond well i'm sorry but that's what i think james bond is fun it's stylized masculinity it's not toxic it's stylized we know what we're going to get when we go to the cinema. We're going to get this indestructible character and we're going to get unbelievable car chases and a whole lot of nonsense from Pew about all his gadgets. It's fun. Can't we be allowed to enjoy ourselves? Yes. Well, I've got some breaking news for Keir Starmer. You know, guess what? James Bond is actually a fictional character. He's not really killing anybody either. Indeed. Indeed. And I mean, I, I, as I say, it's just fun. We should be allowed to enjoy ourselves. And the plague of our society at the moment is isms. Yes. You know, sexism, racism, it's all isms. And they look for isms everywhere uh, uh, where they're not intended. I don't think Ian Fleming was full of isms. I think he devised a jolly good character, which has brought a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. My only objection is that Judy Dench is no longer M. Yes, I she was the best M ever. She was very good, wasn't she? But but there we are. We had to we had to move with the times. Apparently, apparently, being um, sort of equality or opportunity for women is no longer a thing. It's got to be beyond that now. But Anne, listen, great to talk to you as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Anne Whittaker, former Conservative MP, former Brexit Party MEP as well.